Hey, oh, listen to this guy. Once upon a decade ago, there was a man named Jared Fogel who convinced people that he lost 245 pounds by eating whole loaves of bread from Subway. Which, by the way, as a personal trainer, that's not how that works. That's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to talk about the fact that he's a cholo. And what happened to him in prison? See, in 2016, Jared flew his ass all the way out to the great state of Florida where he told the radio host that was interviewing him that he found middle school girls particularly attractive. Wait. What? I'm not gonna read you the other stuff that he said to her because ugh. But this woman as a mother or two felt what he was saying so off-putting that she went unofficially undercover to expose Jared for the monster he really is. And this woman slash hero spent four years collecting evidence against Jared. Here's where it get good. I like this part. Fogel was sentenced to 15 years in federal prison and two years into his sentence he was beaten within an inch of his life by another inmate who hates child molesters named Steve Nick. Can we get that dude some money on the books? Steve was interviewed and he was quoted is saying, I had to hit him. I don't like child molesters. I can't figure out how anybody can do that to kids, so I have to hit them. God damn, Steve, I like your style. Former Subway pitch man and convicted file, Jared Fogel has been attacked in prison. Jared Fogel uh, got a beat down. A 38-year-old was reportedly jumped by a 60-year-old inmate and punched in the face. He was left bloodied and bruised. It is not unexpected, I should say. The inmate who allegedly attacked Fogel was identified as Stephen Nigg, who is doing time on gun charges. It happened at the Englewood Prison in Colorado. Uh, you know he is in prison uh, for all sorts of bad things. Now we know how his fellow inmates feel about him. Hey everybody, welcome back. I know that it's been a hot minute since we've had a full length over here, but trust me when I say this, this one was worth waiting for. Today we're gonna be talking to Steve Nigg, and he is the guy who inside a federal prison got his hands on Jared Fogel, the disgraced subway mascot, who we all know had an affinity for doing terrible things to little kids. And I'm really excited to share this one with you guys, man, because I personally, I love Steve, man. He is the embodiment of what an old school convict is, and they do not make them like that anymore these days. Let me tell you that right now. So we're going to jump right into this, but before we do, you know what we got to do. We do it every single time. <laughs> So before we jump into the interview, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a major life update for me. You know that me and Jax have been building our own house and it's been a long process. One of the hardest parts about that is not having a dedicated studio to be able to be making content in. As you can see, I have just been taking up little spaces in the house in the meantime, which means that not only is it harder for me to concentrate, but if we have anything with the family going on, I don't have anywhere to be able to record. So I'm incredibly proud to be able to tell you guys that I finally found a company that I believe in enough to be able to do an ad partnership with and wait till you hear what we have planned you guys this is wild i partnered with a company called containing luxury and what they do is they turn simple shipping containers like this into luxurious masterpieces of housing for people who would not otherwise be able to afford the current housing prices in this country containing luxury is working on housing programs for the homeless housing for veterans and housing for people who are coming out of prison and transitioning back into our communities they're also working on a custom built studio that they're going to be delivering here that you guys are going to be able to see firsthand in every piece of content that I do in the future. So if you're interested in affordable housing or a unique investment opportunity, check out Containing Luxury's link in the description of this video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here with Steve Nigg, man. He's the guy who smashed out Jared from Subway in prison, and he has an incredible story that goes much deeper than that. We're really grateful to have him here with us. Hey, thanks for spending your time with us today, Steve. Thanks for having me, JD. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. So I just want to like start out by saying uh, thank you for your service. Thanks for what you did to Jared. And Jared's not the only chomo that you smashed out while you were in prison, is he? No, I ended up... Uh... Because I actually count it, and uh, every time I smashed one, they would transfer me. So I ended up getting transferred seven different federal prisons, and I ended up smashing 21 child molesters. You got 21 under your belt, dog. On this bid. That On this bid. So <laughs> that makes you like a, an official hunter, I would say. That's what I'm hoping to do uh, in the new, near future. As soon as I get off home confinement, I hope to team up with some of you guys and go out and chase them down. 
Hell yeah, brother. So I actually got introduced to you by a very interesting individual that I think we're mutual friends with as well. Uh, Jason Volkovich, the Alaskan Avenger. Yes, that's a, such a good kid. I, he's got quite a story and uh, he's tough hanging in there doing his time like a man. Yes, sir. He 100% is. And we're hoping to get him out a little sooner than uh, what they wanted to let him out. He, we, he's already got five years stripped off his sentence. Um, so right. hopefully he will get out sooner. For those of you at home who don't know Jason's story, Jason is the man in Alaska who used the registry of people that did terrible things to children right. uh, and hunted them down, broke into their homes, took a hammer and beat them and told them that he was the avenging angel for what they had done to those innocent children. Because like my story, you know, Jason had had that happen to him as a kid. It happened to yeah. me. It happened to Jay. And Jay just took it real personal and went and got real hands on with it. Um, which, uh, you know, Steve has gone out and gotten hands on with it too. You have a long standing history of trying to protect children, Steve. Will you talk about that with us? Yes. Well, it's, actually it's just the way I was raised. My mother and father both raised me and my brothers and sisters to always take care of the underdog. Somebody that needs protecting, protect them. And I took that to heart, and I've been doing it since I was a child. I just, uh, I never liked bullies or cowards. A bully and coward pretty much the same thing. And that's just what a, really what a child molester is. They're bullying people they know they, know they could take advantage of. You know, yeah. some 10-year-old kid, but they know they're 40, 50 years old. It's easy for them to uh, bully a, a kid. So those are the ones that I really target the most. So you you seem like you're an old school convict to me, man. Uh, do you think that's an accurate depiction? Definitely. Uh, how how much time would you say you've served in your lifetime? Counting uh, juvenile centers, about thirty years. Thirty years in. Now you did time in a Florida JIT camp way back in the day. Nineteen sixty nine. That was my first juvenile center, uh, Pensacola. Okay. Okay, how would you say that the JIT camps compare? Because you've been to big federal penitentiaries too. How would you say the JIT camps compare to some of the big federal penitentiaries? Well, it's completely different from 69 to 2023. I just got out this year. But uh, yeah, there, there just isn't a comparison. But most of the federal prisons I was in, a lot of them were lows. That's why there were so many damn child molesters. And that's why I kept getting transferred because I was trying to go up. Most people try to come down. I, I, I was trying to go up. I just had enough of being around them. But you know the point system. You don't have points. You can't go up. I only went to Terre Haute's the only medium I ever went to. Yeah. So when, when I was doing my state time, dude, like I, I went from doing two years at the only maximum security prison in, in the state of Oregon. It's an old school Shawshank looking you know, built 200 years ago prison. And I did two years there and I got used to it. And I really like, I liked the time. It was a lot of cell time and everything. Then right. I hit minimum because I, I, I screwed up and I was good for six months and they shot me out to a minimum and uh, I'm in dorms and nobody knows how to act. The respect right. level is down here. Down. There's a lot of weirdos, man. And like, I, I asked to go back multiple times and they're like, no, no, you're not going back. So I get it, the wanting to go back up thing. Um, right. So what did you what did you go to prison for, Steve? I know you've done multiple sets, but what what was the things that sent you to prison? Well, the first, the biggest sentence I ever did was 1976 to 1990. That was for a series of armed robberies. I was 21, and I went to Arizona State Prison, Florence. And... Uh, I got out in 90, and I was out all the way from 90 to 2010. And then uh, my father had passed away, and he, he left me his gun collection to sell. And in doing so, his uh, he just married this woman for she could get his Social Security and military benefits. But she wanted everything, so she set me up because I'm being a felon. I Just for touching the guns. I got uh, 15 years because they gave me that. Are you hip to armed career criminal? Yeah, that ACC charge is no joke. Yeah. They went back to 1976 and used those three armed robberies against me. 
and gave me 15 years. And I've talked about that armed career criminal uh, with my community here on YouTube before and how ACC is day for day, right? There's no good time on that? Yes, there's a good time. There's a good time? Yeah. Okay. So 15 years, man. And it was just because your dad passed you down his gun collection. Yes, I was the executor of the estate. And I've been out all this time since 1990 doing real good, productive citizen, and uh, had a good job, good business. And uh, she just got greedy and wanted everything. That and, is uh, so wild. So I ended up going to prison just for touching guns. They were not using nothing, no crimes, no nothing, just touching them. Yeah, absolutely. I just did a video the other day. Somebody was asking me if I could like go to a gun range and use somebody else's gun that was legal. And I was like, bro, I can't be in the same room as a gun that's not locked right. up. Like, yo, them feds would hammer my ass. Even if you got caught, because I, I ran into another guy, he got 15 years armed career criminal because he had, they pulled him over and they searched his car and there was two bullets in the back of his car. He got 15 years for two bullets. So I was locked up with a dude in county jail who'd been in county jail for two and a half years fighting an armed career criminal charge off a shell casing. And mm. the feds were trying to get him on it. And he was like, he was not going to back down, bro. Like, dude had lost 80 pounds being in county, getting starved out. Um, and I got out before his case was over. So, you know, I, I got out and I shot him some money to his books to get him canteen and everything for, while he was fighting the case. But I never did hear how his case ended up, man. The feds will come after you, bro, and, and they can pull some crazy stuff. Yes, they have all the they have more power than the judges. Yeah, absolutely. My judge, my judge was going to give me probation and if he could drop the armed career criminal. And the prosecutor said, nope, it's a mandatory minimum. You will give him 15 years. And the judge apologized before he gave him a sentence. That's, That's crazy. Cool. Yeah, the power they have. Just yeah. with conspiracies, charges, they got all the power. Uh, judges got none, and we don't have any. And that's why they have like a 90, what is it, a 98.7% conviction rate or something like that? Because nobody, you're scared to go to a jury trial because if they say, take this 10 years and you say, no, I'm going to jury trial, if you lose, you're going to get double your sentence or more. Yep. yep. So you're forced to take the deal uh, 10 years or 20 years because you know if you lose it in trial, you're going to get uh, 30, 40 years. There's something different about seeing like your name on some paperwork and it says the state of Oregon or the state of Florida or the state of California against Steve Nigg as opposed right. to the United States of America against right. Steve Nigg, you know? It puts a chill through you. Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> brother, during your time, did you uh did you ever click up? Uh yeah, I was uh back in the day Arizona prison it was a extremely violent prison, and they had a uh, just started. Uh, they had uh, Mexican mafia been there, and they were ruling the joint. And the blacks uh, had organized Ma Mau Maus, mm -hmm. and a few, and uh, they had some Muslims together. And then the whites in 1977, when I got there, were organized an Aryan Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. So I got involved in that while I was in that prison. Okay. So did you take that that label to the feds with you? Yes, it's all those years later, it was still there. It was okay. still on my record and everything. They, they, you know, they knew it. They tried to use it against me, but it didn't didn't work very well. But <laughs> yeah, so I, mind. I wasn't trying to hide nothing, you know. I'm not ashamed of anything. Do they call it uh STG in the feds, security threat group? Yes. Yeah, that's what that's what they called it in, in multiple states that I know about is it, they call you a security threat group member, which actually gives you an FBI file like right off rip if they hit you with that label. So like me and, and everyone that I'm friends with all have FBI files. I'm sure you've got one, too. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So do you want to run us through uh, what happened with the situation with Jared Fogle, man? I had already been in the in the shoe. Everybody knows what the shoe is, right? So it's the special housing unit? Yes. Were you I in just, the shoe on disciplinary? 
Yes, I was. The first prison I was in was Sandstone, Minnesota. Uh, they actually got a petition. The ch child molesters got a petition to get me moved out of there. They all, a couple hundred signed it. I a couple believe. hundred. Yeah, and I got a couple there. But the, the, those uh, COs in uh, Minnesota, they some tough ass boys. They they just uh, looked the other way anytime I did something. But I, I ended up getting transferred to Colorado, Inglewood, and that's when uh, I've been in the shoe maybe three or four times there already for smashing chomos, and I was trying to go up and go to a medium, and uh, they just wouldn't do it because I, I only had like three points, four points, and you need like 15 to order a medium. So then they said uh, we heard that Jared was coming there. So I got my car together. I said, all right, guys, there's no way I'm old school. There's no way that this Chomo Jared's going to walk this yard with me in it. I can't do that. And I said, anybody want to put in any work? And uh, nobody in my car wanted to put the work in because they were all scared of that hate crime getting five more years. So I just said, all right, I'll do it. So were you holding the keys at that point? Uh, you know, in that joint, it wasn't too much of a key holder. Just because I was older, uh, if there was trouble, I'd solve it. You know, unless it couldn't be solved, then we'd have to get down. But uh, it was a pretty mild joint, really. Yeah. So you guys knew about Jared from Subway, and you guys found out he was coming to the prison that you were at before he even landed? Yes. You came from Indiana. That's where you got, uh, went to court. And uh, the COs let us know he was coming. So the and, COs uh, let you know that this famous Chomo was headed to your yard. Yes. Hey, the <laughs> COs hate Chomos just as much as we do. They just can't do much because, uh, and I've seen it happen, where they they lose their job, they get sued, they get charges. So they're, they're really strapped more than we are. We could at least do it and yeah. get away you know, just go to shoe, get transferred, whatever, big deal. But they have a lot more to lose. So you went to your car, and these youngsters were all too scared of losing some good time or getting an extra five years on a hate crime. Right. And so you were just like, okay, I got this. Right. And they they weren't sure. They didn't think I was. And uh, he got there, and he was there for some weeks. Before, he was in a different unit. I finally called him on the athletic field. So I, I waited. He was uh, out walking, and uh, he had a couple of guys to always hang with him, his so-called bodyguards. And, bodyguards? And they were chomos. <laughs> yeah. And I just got out of the shoe for beating one of them up, beating the hell out of them. So <laughs> I, I just started jogging. And I went right past him. Then I turned around and just went at him. And the, the people there around him, they ran like hell because they knew who I was and knew what I was there for. Yes. So His I bodyguards went running. Went running. They <laughs> left him cold. Do you think he was paying these Chomo bodyguards? Oh, he's definitely paying them. That was everybody knew that. Yeah, he went to commissary, got him everything he wanted, sent money under books. Yeah, he uh he was he he was trying to organize all the child molesters too, which is another thing that got me uh tell him, yeah, you could go in the weight pit, we could do everything we want because we didn't when I lift weights, I don't let the chomos in there. So we lift weights and uh he was trying to organize them. You know, he thought he was a big shot. So the are there are these like I've never heard of chomo enforcers before, bro. Like, are these like, are they halfway tough chomos at least? You know, out of the 21 chomos that I beat the hell out of, I only had three that were, that could fight. And two of them called me out. Because after I beat the hell out of Jared, they transferred me to Arizona prison. And at, I beat, I, I, I smashed this one chomo there named Jeff Durant. You might know his, uh, remember his father. This guy tried to act like Jerry because of stardom. His dad was 
Don Durant, who played in that show, TV show, number one TV show in 59 and 60 called Johnny Ringo. Johnny Ringo was, uh, yeah, it was a number one TV show, and uh, Don Durant starred in it, and his son, Jeff Durant, was in prison for child molesting, and he was in our car. And I, I told those guys, there's something wrong with this guy. I could tell by looking at him, he's a chomo. So we had a good CO look him up, sure enough. So I ended up beating the brakes off of him, and they transferred me to, uh, let's see where they go from there. Uh, Latuna, I think it was. This this dude infiltrated your car? Yes. Because now, this isn't paid... like your actual gang. Is this just the car of people hanging out? Right. At the... right. This in just uh, just a white boy car. Okay. Yeah. And they didn't check and run no, no paperwork. I, I I run paperwork still. I want yeah. to see your paperwork before. But they don't do that in a lot of these lows. That's another problem. So this guy played off because he's Don Durant's son, the TV actor, and he had millions of dollars because he Don had died uh, and left him, uh, I think it was $8 million. So he's got all this money and fame, just like Jerry did. That's why everybody looked at Jerry like he was a god. Uh, you know, a famous person's a trauma. They, they felt so proud to have him in there. And uh, Jeff Durant was acting the same way. And then I, I discovered it, and then... Uh, that's what got me transferred out of there. So was it more personal for you because he had been sliding and hanging out? I know for me, if a chomo was like hanging out and kicking it with my people and, you know, eating at the same tables, that makes it, that's personal, bro. That, that, Very personal. they got something fucking extra coming from me yeah. if they've been breathing my same air, dog. Yep. I want to do a lot more than just give them a beating too, let me tell you. But at lows, not much more than a, a good solid fist fight happens. Once in a while, you get a stabbing, but very seldom. So was but he then, halfway tough? No. No, <laughs> he, he hit the ground hard and cried like a little bitch, just like Jared did. Jared cried like a little bitch. Yeah. He didn't even fight back, but I wasn't I wasn't going to stop just because he wasn't fighting back. I no. just kept beating, beating him, you know. No, hey. They didn't stop because the kid wasn't fighting back. Exactly. They get exactly. what they get, bro. And they hurt the kids a lot more than I hurt him. I, I wish I could have done more. If I get away with that, I would have got. I would have done a, done a lot more. So I know that, like the chomos that I've beaten up in prison, bro. The majority of them never even tried to swing back. Not even trying to slap, bro. They right. they went into straight defensive, trying to get away. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you've have you had more than two actually try to fight back? I had three that fought back, and the, the one, the main one that called me out. See, he called me. I was in Beaumont, Texas. Now, uh, I was in Latuna. I smashed some chomos there. They sent me to Beaumont. Beaumont was a that was a decent prison there. They got some tough people in all the cars: white car, black car tough in it, all of them but uh he called me out because he, he wanted bragging rights to say he's the one that beat the guy that beat uh jared up see because he a was uh, he, wanted bragging rights yeah this he ran wild. a car chomos even have a car did a chomo car and he was the rep what's the so chomo won- car called do they have a name no, we just call him trauma car. We don't let him do that, get that far with it. But if uh, trauma gets out of line, they go there and talk to him. I never did. I said, no, if a trauma gets out of line with me, I ain't talking to no rep. I'm beating the shit out of the trauma around the spot. Yeah. That's it. Come on. They're giving him way too much respect. Way too much. But he called me out and it was a good fight. But I, I wasn't going to, I got him beat down to the ground. I was beating him so bad. Two guys in my own car had to pull me off them. Good, bro. A chomo called you out. They're not yeah. allowed to do that. What planet no. is this? It blew my mind, but I was happy about it because I'm all for it. They call me out all day long. I'll be there. Yeah, for real. Yeah, I've never seen a chomo call a good dude out, bro. I've never even seen a chomo call out another chomo, really. No, it, it's very rare. Yeah. 
So you literally had to get pulled off by two dudes off this dude. Yeah, I would. I wasn't going to stop, but he yep. wasn't. Uh, he was still trying to fight, though. I, I, I'll give him that much. He's a chomo, so he can't get no respect for me. No, no matter what. bro. No, no. Just because you got heart doesn't mean you get respect right. if you a chomo, bro. You can't earn that shit back. You lost that. Never. You're not human no more. Was that the best fight that you had in prison? Well, it was the best fight I had to chomo. I had a. I just like to fight, to be honest. So <laughs> yeah. you know, I I had fights with uh, other people, other cars, and but you know, that was done privately where nobody could get caught or busted, and we're not going to tell on each other. Of course, the only ones that snitch on me ever was the chomos. So you uh, you ever been in prison during? Like gang wars or race riots or any of that type of thing? Yeah, Arizona State Prison. Uh, in the 70s, Arizona State Prison was probably the most violent prison in the country at the time. And there was nothing but stabbings and riots in that prison. Please tell the people at home, because I've never been in a riot in prison. I've been on some street riots. We, we liked to riot back in the day here in Eugene. But um, people are always asking me what a prison riot is like when you're living through it. Uh, can you talk about that? It don't last very long, not, unless it's uh, overtaken. Unless it's the riots I was in was, you, you know, a race riots pretty much, but it, it, not a, t overtaken the prison riot where everybody's together. So yeah. those, uh, just a regular riot don't last long at all. No, you they know, get it, the warning uh, shots going on, and then everybody gets right. down, or they start shooting people. Right, they, they don't play around. And uh, Arizona, I think they had 30-odd sixes up in the towers. And those hurt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too, dog. So there's there was a – back in 2016 at OSP, it's got – you know, they got the big walls, the old-school penitentiary walls and the gun right. towers. And um, I had left at this point, but my homeboys told me after they got off lockdown – um, they had it crack off on the yard. And, uh, you know, it was it was one of the big Mexican cars – and they were going after somebody and they fired the warning shot. When one of the dudes in the gun tower went to fire a warning shot, the cop ended up shooting himself in the leg, like in the wow. thigh. I don't know how you get a <laughs> rifle shot in your thigh on accident. First off, that's crazy. One of the other gun tower cops went to fire a warning shot and he hit one of the Mexican homeboys in the balls with his oh. warning shot. Blew his balls off. Dude got like, I think dude got half a million in a lawsuit for that. So, uh, you know, that didn't last very long. I know that back um, in like the late 1800s, there was, or maybe it was the, the very early uh, 1900s, there was a riot where they took over OSP and it lasted like 15, 17 hours. Um, mm. But, you know, those are different than just when they're, it's popping off like a race riot or something on the yard. Arizona prison actually transferred me to Kansas prison, uh, Lansing State Prison. I caught a, I caught a stabbing beef in Arizona, and they took me to street trial, but I beat it. So yeah. then they automatically want you out of there. If you beat the case, uh, they want you out of there because they're embarrassed now. So, Art, can you talk about that a little bit, the stabbing and how that went down? Well, yeah, actually, probably not on that. Well, I got found not guilty, but I can't do nothing to me, I guess. But it was just, uh, it was a rat. Okay. That, uh, and I was accused of stabbing six times. And uh, and then the, the administration labeled it uh, a hit to uh, get initiated into the Aryan Brotherhood. It's called getting your bones. So the, they just said, uh, uh, Steve Nick just got his bones today. So they, he's, now he's a full fledged member of the Aryan Brotherhood. Yeah. And then they took me to free trial and then they transferred me to Kansas prison. That's crazy. And then you beat the case. Beat the case. Yep. Steve, I want to talk a little bit about what you've been doing since you've been out because you've been doing some amazing things to continue to help protect children since you've been out. Can we talk about what you've been doing? Uh, I'd love to. Uh, as I was saying to you before, uh, I'm 68 years old. I'm definitely on my last chapter of life. And this last chapter, I want to do what I can to redeem myself 
and not that I ever think I've never thought myself as a bad person. I've done some bad things, but I've never done anything evil. Evil is what a what a chomo is. That's evil. You know, evil is, is killing somebody for no reason, and yet you enjoy it. I never enjoyed hurting anybody and suffer chomos. I definitely enjoyed that. But I'm trying to redeem myself and leave this world on a good note. I want to leave on a positive note. And I've always loved kids, you know, I, and I, I want to help them. So I've started an organization, Steve's Warrior Children. And what I'm doing is getting uh, athletic events going like a, a 10K run, uh, golf outings, anything like this. And we're making money, and all the money goes to uh, abused children. So and it's, it's coming together good. But as you know, I'm on home confinement still, so I can't really spread my wings yet. But February 16th, I'm off, and I'll be able to go out in the community and uh, really kick this off. How long you been on home confinement, Steve? Since uh, I left the halfway house, let's see, September 8th. I've been on home confinement since September 8th. Okay. Well, you're doing amazing on home confinement. I know home confinement is a real pain in the ass, bro. I did two years of it myself. So kudos to you for doing so amazing on your home confinement. Um, do you guys, are you just kind of in a holding pattern with being able to com do community events until you get off or do you have upcoming events? I can't do nothing. Yeah. I get like 12 hours a week. You know, I go to gym, work out, go out to dinner, things like this, go out to the kids' sports events, hockey games for the kids. They have a like going there, but uh, that's it. But so, yeah, February's here, so. How can people, February is coming up, bro. How can people get in contact with, uh, with what you're putting together and how can people help and contribute and be a part of that? My nephew, Jimmy, he's getting a... Uh, He's been helping me all along since the very beginning. He's the one that got me on Facebook when I, after that Jared incident. And uh, he called TMZ, got me on TMZ. And as I say, that TMZ helped me a lot because they were trying to give me five years for the hate crime. But all the pressure they put on, they just said, just get rid of that guy. But uh, <laughs> he's starting a, a new, uh, like a website, Steve's Warrior Children. But until then, uh, just... Steve Nigg, N-I-G-G. -G. You can get on my Facebook and keep track of everything I'm doing, and I sure appreciate it if people would do that. Yes, sir. So we're going to put links, everybody, in the description down below this video to everything that Steve is doing so that you guys can get that one-click action to be able to be a part of and check out and support Steve's Warrior Children. Um, it's something that I'm going to be getting involved with and investing in because I think it's a really important thing. And man, Steve has been putting in work for kids for a really long time. It's amazing to see him out here on the streets, being able to continue that work in a pro social way. Um, I'm sure that when Jason gets out, uh, me and him and Steve are going to be meeting up and doing some amazing yeah. things. So you guys can look forward to seeing that in the future. And Steve is right on the brink of being able to do more for the Steve's Warrior Children Foundation. So if you guys want to get involved on the ground floor and help him to do something beautiful for kids that are in need, now would be a great time to jump in and be able to support him and, uh, you know, give him a follow and just whatever you can do to get involved. So, Steve, before we go, is there anything that you want to say to the people, man? Just that uh, I, I appreciate anything you do for me because I, everything is going to the kids. I'm keeping a clean record to make sure everyone knows where the money's going because I, I worry about that a lot because it's unfortunate, but there's people out there who are supposed to be making money for whatever cause, and they're keeping it. It's uh, there's a lot of cases like that, but I'm every when I get money, it's I'm going to post it where it goes, every penny, so everybody knows this is legit. As I say, this is this is my last hurrah here, and I want to make it right. And uh, JD, I sure appreciate you having me on the show, man. You're a cool dude. Man, I really appreciate you taking the time to hang out with us, man. And um, you know, maybe we could do some more collabs in the future. Uh, I really genuinely enjoy talking to you, man. You're a good human being. I love the mission that you're on. You're an old school convict, bro. 
Um, and, you know, I just can't wait to see and hopefully be a part of supporting what you do here in the future, brother. Thanks a lot, J.D. I appreciate you, buddy. All right, man. Hey, big love and respect to you, Steve. Big love and respect to everybody who's out there hanging out, watching. Thank you for spending your time with us today. We really appreciate you being in this community. I appreciate you guys going and helping support Steve. One love, y'all. Be good or be good at it. We're going to see you on the next one. Hey, kids. You want some candy?